This is Radio 314 on the Red Ice Radio Network. Welcome back to another Radio 314 discussion. This is Lana, and joining me once again is Lisa Arbacheski of TragedyAndHope.com. And you don't want to miss this conversation because we're going to discuss a topic that's rarely examined from this perspective. Namely, feminism has been used as a tool for psychological warfare to divide and to conquer. Welcome back, Lisa. How have you been? I've been well, Anna. Thank you for inviting me. And I should say also for your persistence and, <laughs> and for your encouragement, because that was the inspiration behind my gathering the courage to come back on the show and put myself out there. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Well, this is funny because Henrik just did an interview with Lennon Honor on the subject of the male-female union, and both his and this interview kind of synced up unintentionally. So see, that's what happens in the right relationship. Absolutely. That's like the, uh, the history series that, we, that we're doing. We recently re- uh, released an episode on nonviolent communication and the trivium, and it was the same. It was supposed to be a couple of weeks early released, but we had so much going on that it didn't uh, end up going as planned as these things as these things go. And it just so happened that the week that we released it, uh, what it, Laura Lynn, the Unplugged Mom podcast, mm-hmm. she also released an episode on the very same subject on nonviolent communication and. <laughs> The trivium, so it was just a little synchronicity. And the universe just has a way of, you know, letting things work out if you can be like water and, uh, as they say, just go with the flow. That's right. Hey, by the way, I watched the premiere of the film State of Mind, The Psychology of Control on Alex Jones, and you did a super job on the voiceover. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, It was, as you know, uh, sort of a last-minute decision for me to do the narration. It was just a situation where I had to, how do you say, step up to the plate and oh, yeah. uh, just do what had to be done to get the film finished. So I'm really proud of uh, of the end result. And Deborah Stevens, who did the sound mastering, did just really a remarkable job. Uh, it doesn't even really sound like me when I when I listen to it, <laughs> but it sounds terrific. It sounds like so, me. <laughs> I think, too, it's excellent that Alex helped promote the film. I could tell Alex really enjoyed meeting Richard, so that's pretty pretty good. I'm glad to hear yeah, that. Yeah, it was, it was really incredible to be there in, in the studios and uh, the support. And really, I mean, without that kind of a venue and a platform and the audience that Alex has, uh, I don't know where the film would be, but right now it's about uh, the, the free version that's online has over 230,000 views. So it oh. looks like it could go viral. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that this information is relevant to. And uh, I think that it's really just, uh, it's wonderful. And we are grateful that he provided that platform. Um, I think it's interesting, too, because some similar topics come up in, in that film that we also touch upon in our next TV show, but it, ours is a, is a little different. But it seems like a same full of handful of elite freaks, I could say, <laughs> keep coming up. You know, the guys who planted the seeds of eugenics movement, psychology, modern science. And if you look at photos of them, I mean, wow, I get chills from the soullessness in their eyes. You know what I mean? It's really just history repeating. It's all about social control. And you see the strategies playing out over and over again, even in the conversation that you and I are about to have today on the subject of feminism. Uh, You see this divide and conquer strategy playing out. And there is a small group of people that will plunder. Their agenda is to plunder your production efficiently and effectively extracting your wealth. So they really want to uh, have a population of human resources. And, uh, you know, the, the feminist movement is part of that social engineering. It's, right. it's just one small, small part. Uh, and I'm by no means an expert. I'm more interested in learning the history so that, uh, you know, so that at some point, you know, through possibly you and I sharing information, the work that we're all doing, um, this can be something that's, that's history, and you're right, the, the feminist movement is actually very politically motivated, psycholog- it's psychological warfare like you're going to talk about. So I think a good place to begin is to define what feminism is. Well, there's a number of definitions out there. I went to, uh, went, went to Oxford, the Oxford English Dictionary, 
And they, they have there that feminism is the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of equality of the sexes. And it reads, the issue of rights for women first became prominent during the French and American revolutions in the late 18th century. In Britain, it was not until the emergence of the suffragette movement in the late 19th century that there was significant political change. A, quote, second wave of feminism arose in the 1960s with an emphasis on unity and sisterhood. Seminal figures included Betty Friedan and uh, Germaine Greer. I'm not actually familiar with either of those uh, two individuals. And then if you look it up on, you know, Webster or Wiki, it's, it's just essentially the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes and the organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. Um, you know, that's those are a couple definitions. By the way, Betty Frieden and Germaine Greer. Betty Frieden was born, her last name's Goldstein. She's actually Jewish. And Betty and Germaine are both <laughs> communists. <laughs> well, that's, Greer, that's interesting. Yeah, Greer actually <laughs> identified herself as an anarchist communist, which pisses me off because the definition and philosophy of anarchy means society without state. And without state, you don't have these issues that block people from doing what they want to do. Problem solved. Well, it, it's interesting that, that you mentioned that they were communists. And there's a book that, uh, that I wanted to discuss with you called, uh, let's see, The Mighty Wurlitzer, How the CIA Played America. And it's written by Hugh Wilford, and it's published by Harvard University Press. And uh, in the chapter entitled, The Truth Shall Make You Free, on page 154, they discuss this propaganda campaign that is being propagated by the women's movement, funded through the CIA, and we can get into the details of that later. It reads, the first of the committee's regular monthly newsletters issued in April 1953 countered communist exploitation of motherhood for propaganda purposes by accusing the Soviet government of forcing women out to work so that it could exert, quote, absolute control over the child with the opportunity to mold him into the pattern of well-disciplined little robots. The notion that communist totalitarianism had invaded even that most private area of everyday life, the home, became a perennial theme of Cold War Western propaganda. It goes on, but it's just interesting because that's the way things were being framed out during this, this, time, this time period in, in the 50s. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And I'm sure, and it, my point being, I'm sure that Betty Friedan and Jermaine Greer, who, you know, would disagree. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned Gloria Steinem as well. And she's another communist, Jewish communist. So the question becomes, how does psychological warfare come into play in the feminist movement? Because that's what we're talking about. This, that's what this, uh, this book is is providing the factual account of um, the mighty Wurlitzer, how the CIA played America. And for anyone who's not familiar, a Wurlitzer is an organ. So he's saying, Hugh Wilford uh, is saying, they're playing us like an organ, like an instrument. And uh, these, these uh, organizations and someone like Gloria Steinem, I believe they get into, uh, into this with really noble intentions and they just become subject to psychological warfare. Mm -hmm. Then unwittingly, some, and some wittingly, are participating in it. And Gloria Steinem specifically is covered in Chapter 6, the CIA on campus students. And if we go to page 141 through 143, we can read all about her recruitment by Clive S. Gray, who was a former National Student Association, or NSA for short, president, and he became a CIA agent. Additionally, uh, she was approached by Harry Lunn, who was also an NSA former president and a CIA agent. <laughs> she goes into active duty. You can read all about it on page 142 through uh, 147. And it's just, it's really a fascinating account. And you wonder as you're reading through this, did she know, did she have any intimation uh, 
the answer, I, I don't think, is clear. But she was director of the Independent Service for Information, or the ISI. And if you read about the events that went on when she was organizing the Vienna World Festival of Youth and Students, and I believe this is in the 1950s, I'd have to reference the book for the exact date, you read about her engagement with C.D. Jackson, who at the time is, uh, it's in times of war, he's psychological warfare. And during this time, we're not at war, he is the head of time life. And if you just give me a minute, I'll actually go to the page because there's a really great quote. A key contact for Steinem in her ISI publicity work was the former Psy War Supremo, Time Inc. executive, C.D. Jackson, who had secretly volunteered to coordinate a massive anti-festival propaganda campaign on the CIA's behalf, involving Radio Free Europe, Time reporters, and Austrian cabinet ministers. The two first met in late January at Jackson's Rockefeller Center office, but only after Steinem had been made to wait several hours. She goes on to say, uh, they're quoting her here, he was blustery, a name dropper, always talking about how he wrote speeches for Eisenhower. Uh, it goes on, let's see, the Vienna Youth Festival itself is an extremely important event in the great game, C.D. Jackson wrote, the network's president, Frank Stanton, quoting Roger Kipling's Kim, quote, this is the first time commies have held one of these shindigs on our side of the Iron Curtain, <laughs> end quote. Stanton then saw Steinem in his office and assured Jackson that CBS would endeavor to broadcast a half-hour documentary. Quote, Gloria Steinem asked me to help out on this, and Frank Stanton came through handsomely. Jackson self-congratulatingly reported to Cord Meyer of the CIA. So that gets into who is Cord Meyer. And Cord Meyer, well, I'll ask you, do you, do you know about Cord Meyer? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. So when you look into Cord Meyer, his father is Eugene Meyer. Eugene Meyer happens to have been the owner of the Washington Post. He also, if memory recalls, served as Federal Reserve Chairman. <laughs> he was the first president of the World Bank. And I believe he was also the owner of Honeywell Security. So those are his interests. That's why he owns the Washington Post. His, is, his interests aren't investigative journalism. His interests are protecting the empire. In other words, social control of human resources. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting connection. And now you see how, uh, well, I'll let you just respond because I don't know where I was going with that. Well, I think also if we, we should go back even even farther. Like, let's look into when, I don't know if you've looked into this, when the women's lib movement actually began. And what, what are the roots? Where are they coming from? And how has it evolved over the past century? What have, what has your research shown? What, I mean, well, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, my research has shown basically French revolutions. You can trace a lot to the French all the time. <laughs> But then also Rockefeller helped fund the women's lib studies in America. So that really got going here. And then, then comes the birth control, then comes Margaret Sanger, then comes all these writers, right? Right. I, I guess what we're trying to get out of here too is what were these women trying to accomplish to begin with? What, what really spearheaded this movement? Well, I think their intentions, as, we, as I said before, were, were noble. They were looking for... Uh, they're looking for a voice. They wanted to be represented. Maybe you could say a seat at the table, equality, liberty, progress. They would probably have said more of a balance of power, more influence. And uh, I think from my perspective, they're trying to create a better world. And then somewhere along the line, this became, as, as we call, identity politics. So women are letting themselves be defined according to what someone else is defining feminism is like you say they're writing the script for you <laughs> right at some point equality was redefined to mean go out and get a job and leave your home and leave raising your children and your family up to the state to 
the government. Equality is holding an equal job to a man. And it's interesting because uh, I think at the beginning of the conversation, I mentioned social engineering. And, and the reason that you see uh, this agenda being played out through the feminist movement is through the destruction of the family. And it's really just business. It's just about making money off of human resources. Because when you can convince a woman that motherhood is degraded down to a form of slavery instead of the foundation and, you know, the, of the family, the pillar of the family, and you just take away the sacredness, then, you know, you convince them to go out and get jobs and enter the workforce. And it's really interesting because at some point, the, uh, let's see, I have an article here about, that I printed off earlier about prohibition and the income tax and how these, uh, these organizations had been formed by women all over the country and uh, they were interested in alcohol prohibition. But at the time, in, you know, prior to 1913, the bulk of the government's revenue was coming from, about a third of it was coming from the annual revenue with, through liquor taxes. So this was something that was not going to happen, be, just purely because it was business. And then through uh, the passage of, you know, the, the laws that, that made income tax come into effect, through that, and through using these women's organizations, these prohibition organizations, they were able to add income taxes. So now not only do you have everyone paying income taxes, but additionally, when you can convince these women to leave home and go out and get a job, now you're adding an additional uh, income tax form per household. So it's really, I think, just about generating revenue. And, and getting you know, their children, of course. Right. And it's hard to say at what point it was undermined or usurped because I think that it's just been happening all along. It's just history repeating because, uh, you know, the, uh, the women who were involved in prohibition never really saw through to the agenda of, you know, the income tax. They didn't understand that. And so, you know, they're unwitting to it. And then you have uh, someone like Edward Bernays who wants to... Uh, wants to get women smoking because, you know, tobacco is... Yeah, what did he call them? Freedom torches? Torches of liberty or torches of freedom. More like cancer sticks. Right, and, and how does he create this meme? By having New York socialites during some big event, some parade, go down the street and, you know, make a big deal out of taking out their cigarette cases and lighting up in the middle of the street and there's a big torches of liberty or torches of freedom uh, marketing campaign and media campaign, and they're writing about it on the newspapers, and the next thing you know, it's in vogue now. And not only that, but it is a sign of freedom. And so now your freedom and your liberty has been degraded down to being able to light up a cigarette. That's right. Instead of, you know, some other agenda, let's say having that energy redirected towards stopping the uh, the the child and women uh, prostitution and slavery that that business that black market like let's not redirect all of our energy towards these other things that are going on let's just light up a torch of liberty and you know all is well in the world I think too they really played on let's face it I mean there's a lot of unhealthy female male relationships the balance is completely off in most people's relationships there's a lot of uh, as Lennon Honor has talked about, there's a lot of TV propaganda that keeps enforcing this, that keeps creating that war going. So then they, they, they get to these women by pushing motherhood is misery and torture and so is marriage. And then they do shows like Desperate Housewives and the Se Sex in the City, which is written right. by, by gay men and actually Candace Bushnell, who's also a, a socialist. So then you're putting these ideas out there. I mean, Edward Bernays, he had this to say about the video or motion, or motion pictures in his book, Propaganda. He said, the American motion picture is the greatest unconscious carrier of propaganda in the world today. It is a great distributor for ideas and opinions. So they are putting that out there on purpose, this idea. 
Marriage, torture, motherhood, misery. Absolutely. The sexualization of young girls and children within the mainstream mass media, within those productions, within Hollywood films and television shows and within the music industry. Look at the role models that are out there. And you talk about uh, adult relationships. It, this is the relationships that you're seeing played out on the television and in Hollywood films. They're extended adolescents. Those are children. They're like little children who haven't yet figured out what life is all about. And so what you see is competition. You don't see cooperate, cooperation. You don't see two people coming together and making each other stronger. Instead, there's all of this, uh, all these games being played and, and, and people being hurt. And it's the suppression of natural and loving and healthy relationships. And why? Because that's important to control people. Because if, you know, you're distracted by the drama of your relationship and the drama of, you know, the children, what do they see over and over on televisions? Kids can't relate to parents. Parents can't relate to kids. This is a theme that's played out. And so now children think, children think, well, I can't learn anything from my parents. They don't know anything. And I can't learn anything from my grandparents. And so now this is also part of the destruction of the family. And you see the relationships that used to be these strong bonds traditionally. And you still see this within families that have managed to hold it together despite the mass media entrainment. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think, too, the male-female relationship, it's, well, it's fundamental to our survival. And there are so many sinister programs going to create a war, as we've just said. But there's nothing more powerful to me than a man and a woman who are truly united and, and each other's counterpart. There is a spiritual power in that and a physical power in that. And that is why I think they're really trying to get in there and destroy what is feminine, what is masculine. I think that is another reason why they're even using hor chemicals that are hormone disruptors, literally making people gay, making men feminine and women masculine. They want to upset this balance because they know that it is its power. And it, that reminds me of that quote that I sent you from the article. I believe it was a Vigilant Citizen article. Mm -hmm. It was from his article on Wi Eyes Wide Shut. He writes, quote, Eyes Wide Shut is indeed not simply about a relationship. It is about all of the outside forces and influences that define that relationship. It is about the eternal back and forth between the male and female principles in a confused and decadent modern world. Also, more importantly, it is about the group that rules this modern world, a secret elite that channels this struggle between the male and female principles in a specific and esoteric matter. And then he goes on to say the movie, however, does not spell this out. <laughs> like all great art, it's communicated, you know, you have to read between the lines. <laughs> but that's, that's what you just remind me of. Yeah, well, Stalin also saw the power of cinema in Hollywood. I mean, he infiltrated with his people. I've been trying to do a program about it. There's very few people speaking out about it, but there, there are some books. And, you know, it's a typical communist tactic also to use, to use humor as a technique to distribute propaganda. I mean, the Soviets did it all the time. They joked about things. And then children grow up thinking, oh, you're supposed to laugh at things like that. And so they learn what is socially acceptable, and then they conform to it because you aren't cool unless you can laugh at whatever Jay Leno said. And you see that happening right now, big time, against the war against the family unit. Like, oh, that's a social construct. Oh, you're so yesterday, you know? Right, right. You have to have two moms to be cool now. Well, you see this artificially created image of ideal beauty and the ideal female and uh, in, in, all of its, in all of its various forms. And you were talking about books. One book that I have not read through, but Kevin Cole, who's a researcher for Tragedy and Hope, he showed me this book, Globalizing Ideal Beauty by Denise Sutton. And I only read through a, a few chapters of it, but she, she shows you how this artificial image was created via mass marketing and mass media public relations, and just Hollywood propaganda campaigns. And uh, there's another book that's a little bit older by uh, Ed Epstein called The Rise and Fall of Diamonds. And I mention this book because it substantiates uh, some of the things that I read in Denise Sutton's Globalizing Ideal Beauty. She has this chapter on the J. Walter Thompson Company, which was one of the, and still may be, uh, one of the largest 
uh, PR and marketing firms in the world. And they had the De Beers campaign. And they're the ones that created the Diamonds Are Forever mm -hmm. campaign. So Diamonds were not a girl's best friend. Diamonds were not the automatic, uh, you know, in engagement um, symbol of, you know, fidelity and, and whatever else people associate it with. It had nothing to do with that. That is, well, if we want to get into the history, that is the legacy of Cecil Rhodes. And uh, there's recently a couple of es episodes of our history series that Rich recorded with Kevin Cole and Jan Irvin of Gnostic Media, specifically The Last Will and Testament of Cecil Rhodes in the Anglo-American Establishment, which we just released. And then there's another that has to do with the conversation that you and I have been having, that is the origins of the intelligence community. And uh, you, you see how through Hollywood films and through media publication, advertising and media publications, and just a constant bombardment of this meme, this message. Now today, all these years later, this is the automatic thing that guys do. There are all these rules about it and everyone knows about it, right? Mm -hmm. and we, we talk about that uh, in, in State of Mind, the psychology of control also. There's, there's a little section that covers that. But I was fascinated to learn that because I just thought that that was a tradition. Hmm. And most of the time, it's probably dirty old male pigs that are setting this image of beauty worldwide. You're not hot unless you're this and that. So what do they have to gain by reinforcing this image of beauty and making women self-conscious? This unattainable ideal beauty leaves, I think, all of us, I mean, I don't want to speak for all women, but many of the women I know, I think, can relate to this. It leaves us perpetually reaching for something that we really can't attain. And they want to define us. They want to define ideal beauty for us so that we can't define it for ourselves. Why? Because they want to create insecurity and self-loathing and uh, they want to have women trying to mold themselves into this ideal beauty that they're being sold. And uh, I, I think that it comes down to, again, control. The control of the individual. They want to control your mind, your body, your spirit, so that you can be harnessed and utilized as a human resource in their agenda. If they have you uh, distracted again, by this, you know, this, these images in the magazines and what you're seeing on television and in these films and always have you reaching for something else. If you're a brunette, you want to be blonde. If you're blonde, you want to be a brunette. No matter what it is, the grass is greener. And, you know, at this point, they have women mutilating themselves. I mean, literally, I read a few months back about this new plastic surgery that involves the surgeon cutting off the little toe so that women's feet are more slender and oh. fit, and they fit into prettier shoes. They did that in, in Japan, the geishas. They made them wear these really like tiny they would, shoes. They would bind. It was called foot yep. binding, yep. I believe. Oh. Yeah, so it's just, uh, it's control. Well, and then the it's other thing control. is they want to get you in that consumer cycle. So then you buy all the crap you don't need, you know, all, all the poison, basically, makeup, right. synthetic fabrics, all these toxins. And then you're going to get cancer. Then you're going to need a mastectomy. Then you're going to need implants. So <laughs> it puts you on a, on a cycle so they can milk some money out of you while you're dying, basically. Yeah, they, they get us to deprive ourselves of our own uniqueness and our individuality and our inner beauty. And, uh, and they subvert our potential and our creative energy. They redirect it into nonsense and competitiveness and irrationality. And they, they get us in these, uh, these loops of destructive and not very constructive agendas. And people fall for it. I've, I've heard people put out this idea before, but is there some kind of ancient archetype, some ideal woman and man that maybe these elite know about? They know that it works, and so they put that out there? I really don't know. 
Like maybe Lilith I mean, was a feminist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just what is beautiful, you know? I mean, what is beautiful? Because in reality, each individual, each of us is unique, uniquely beautiful. And we're all uniquely loved by other individuals in our life. And at the end of the day, what matters isn't, you know, how much you weigh or what you look like or what color your hair is. It's the people in your life. It's the relationships you have. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's it. That's what it's all about. It's amazing, though, that women fall for it. So, so do guys. It works. It's a, it's a low-level consciousness state of mind. It, it does work. And uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, some of the things that we've gone off on a, a few different tangents and some of the things we've talked about, I mean, I'm trying to imagine myself just listening to this conversation thinking, well, I don't know, that sounds a little bit like, you know, conspiracy or, you know, some conspiracy theories or what have you. But, um, you know, G. Edward Griffin said a couple of weeks ago when we interviewed him for our history series, I think he put it really well. He said, conspiracies are the engine of history. And, you know, that is news to some people. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but it is. And so, you know, I would urge them to, to read some history books and, um, you know, to, to check out some of, you know, to check out State of Mind, for instance, because it's all there. This book that I have, um, the one that I, I reread this morning, a couple of chapters, The Mighty Wurlitzer, How the CIA Played America, I think this should be a must read for everyone. There's some other books that Rich put out on the desk for me this morning that I haven't read yet that are in my, uh, they're, they're in my list. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, Compromised Campus, which was published by Oxford. And let's see, Universities and Empire, Money and Politics in the Social Sciences During the Cold War, which it says is edited by Christopher Simpson. And one other is Imperial Brain Trust, the Council on Foreign Relations and United States Foreign Policy. And uh, the reason that I suggest these books, you and I haven't really talked about a lot of the connections that I made this morning in reviewing Wilford's book. But as I'm reviewing his book, which is, again, published by Harvard, I'm trying to, fig to find sources, additional sources, other than what he's providing. And these are the books that came up in Rich's brain model. So there's, there are all these connections that we haven't even touched on. Um, we got into a little bit Gloria Steinem, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. That's actually in the chapter before how the CIA influenced feminism. That's in the chapter on students and, and the CIA on campus. So it's, it's really interesting. And I would suggest uh, that people try and either find these books online or get yourself a copy. I think they're really affordable uh, as used books. We got all of our copies used. Well, you bring up a good point to the campuses. It always begins in the school. <laughs> always. Right, right. Virginia Woolf, who everyone has to study in school. She's another communist feminism, by the way. Her stories always mock the individual pursuit of freedom. Like, oh, ha, ha, ha. It's about the collective, not the individual. <laughs> and really, it's about individuals coming together. It's about people who are responsible for themselves, who are independent thinkers, who have intellectual self-defense coming together volitionally and saying, you know, we have common ground. We recognize that. We have common needs as human beings. And in order to get our needs met, right now, our, our, our needs are not being met. And in order to do so, in order to effectively resist you know, we need to come together and organize, but not as collectivists, yeah. as individuals. Exactly. There's a difference, people. <laughs> there is a difference. And you mentioned, you mentioned education and the school. And I would, just, uh, I would just mention the Ultimate History Lesson, A Weekend with John Taylor Gatto, which is available online for free. And it gives a lot of additional context on uh, the underground history, the history that we're not being taught in school of American education, how it was modeled off of the Prussian system for social control and to instill essentially absolute fealty to authority in children while they're young and they lack intellectual self-defense. 
in order to make them into human resources to serve this elite ruling class. This is, you know, nothing new. John discovered it he, and in his book, The Underground History of American Education, uh, a lot are a lot of the resources. And you could also read a book like Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, written by Georgetown professor Carol Quigley. And, you know, it's just, it's all there. It's all there. If you take the time and, you know, maybe redirect an hour or so a week and just check some of these things out, read a few pages, you know, in the evening before you go to bed, just find the time. I think another area we should get into, uh, I wanted to just define this to bring it out for a second because I said Marxist feminism. So the definition is, is a subtype of feminist theory which focuses on the social institutions of private property and capitalism to explain and criticize gender inequality and oppression. Can you believe that? These people just blame capitalism for everything. It just cracks me up. And then you go somewhere like communist well, they, Sweden and it's not any better. You know, you, sorry, I just want to get this in here real quick. The women they're they're raised to basically hate men. They treat them like crap. The men are emasculated. The women are not soft anymore. They're not classy anymore. They get mad when a guy opens a door for them. It's a whole other kind of slavery, a mental slavery. And again, it's that divide and conquer agenda. And in terms of, you know, blaming capitalism or this or that, it's they just want us all whacking at the branches and never <laughs> getting to the root cause never understanding the root cause, because if you don't understand the root cause of the problem, then you aren't going to be able to solve it. Yeah. You're not going to resolve anything for yourself, and you're going to continue to have your energy redirected into someone else's agenda into, instead of into an agenda that benefits you and your family. Yeah. And like you said, again, it's like all of these identity politics movements are, are trying to get you corralled up into a specific form of collectivism, and then you're easy, then, then they got you. It's easy. Right. It's easy to control people who are under the influence of, uh, of illusions, under false impressions that have blind spots. We all have that. We all have blind spots. We all have beliefs that still remain unchecked. I come across some every day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the answer to that is learning. That's the solution. It's learning and then sharing what you've learned. And then you just sort of repeat that process. I mean... And it's a really simple process. We all do it naturally, maybe just not consistently and deliberately, but we can practice. I practice every day. And it's really simple. It's just observation, identification, organization, removal of some contradictions and some fallacies. And then that leads to an understanding. And then you communicate in a meaningful way, in a compassionate way with other human beings so that you can validate what you've come to know and understand. And then you can all make more informed decisions and take more informed actions and not have any regrets, but have some happiness and serenity. And I think everyone could use a little bit more of that. I know I could. So it's about being an individual, having self-responsibility and being the change that we want to see because that's the only way, again, that we're going to effectively resist tyranny is for enough people to come together and recognize our common ground, relate to one another, start communicating and organizing volitionally because we can, we have the ability to create a better world. That's right. It's just that our imagination has been turned off for That's the most part. Sure has. Snuffed out. <laughs> well, me as a woman, when I look at all these things and I zoom way out, I see that one of the obstacles for the control system is men that still have balls, men that fight, men that say no. So there is a war against the men and they want to use the women to emasculate them. <laughs> well, that's the relation. Those are the relationships that you see. Those are the themes you see being played out every night on television. And not only that, but I remember not too long ago, Alex Jones came on the radio one day and he was just furious because he had been out the evening before and he was at some restaurant where he and his family were going to have a meal and he walked in and the entire bar was full of men and this football game was on and they were just all they had so much energy and there was so much passion in that room and he was like wow I wish I could channel that energy and get these guys for one hour a week that interested and excited in the world around them 
and figuring out how to solve the problems that we're, that we're all facing, that we're all facing, because things are not getting better with the economy. Our food is not getting healthier. GMOs are in 70%, and that's what they're saying, of the food in our grocery stores. I don't even know anymore if it's just processed foods. I think it's fruit and vegetables too. <laughs> it's, it's still unclear because we don't have labeling. And how in the world can people not be irate over the fact that the food in their grocery store is not labeled, whether or not it's genetically modified. How can this be? Well, it's because they don't know. <laughs> so thank God for people like Alex Jones and thank God for you guys and for, for tragedy and hope and for everyone who's out there trying to just, you know, work together and help each other to inform the rest of the people who need to be informed so that we can actually make a bigger splash than they do. Because right now, Monsanto is paying off all the government agencies so that they can go on undetected. Cool. Yeah, you make a really good point about, yeah, Alex going into that bar. And I've heard Hendrick say something like that before, too. It's just amazing. And same thing with the women. It's like, get your act together. Pull your head out of your ass, you know. Things are happening and they have, right. women they have the power. We're not weaklings. No one holds a gun to our head and makes us stay at home or makes us do anything. We can do whatever we want to. Right. Absolutely. And you bring up a good point. It makes me think about women's relationships with each other and how these relationships also, it's not just men and women, the relationships that we see, the themes playing out again through Hollywood and television and, and et cetera, it's about women competing with one another. Oh, yeah. And tearing each other down. And we, you mentioned that uh, Desperate How Housewives. I don't yeah. watch that, but I have seen it. Um, I've seen, you know, the, the commercials for it. I've probably seen it on The Soup, that show that makes fun of all the reality TV, et cetera. But that's exactly what you see. These women aren't coming together and making each other stronger and empowering each other, you know, as mothers, as wives, as sisters, just as women, yeah. as human beings. They're not coming together. Instead, what you see is this really unhealthy and destructive competition. Oh, and liberation means I can go make out with a woman. I'm liberated. That's the well, extent of it. Well, whatever it means for you, as long as that's true to you. But I don't think people are really playing out roles that they're creating for themselves. I don't think they're writing their own script. I think like 70% of the people out there, maybe more, I don't know, maybe 90, but a lot of people out there are playing out roles that they've seen their whole lives. Whether it's, uh, let's see, Joy Camp, you interviewed those, them, those guys, uh, Benny mm -hmm. and uh, Kevin, a couple weeks ago. And I'm sure you saw the princess intervention video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what did you think of that? It's hysterical. I mean, we are raising little girls who all want to be princesses. Like, why are, why are we doing this? Why are we perpetuating these ideas, these ideals to our children? Why, are, why aren't we, why is Barbie still every little girl's favorite doll, that an American girl? Like, these are just not healthy images. I mean, sure, it's not a big deal, but those are the main images. There's really no balance. The, the the real real women are not being represented. No, you're absolutely right. In healthy friendships, healthy relationships, whether it be between two women, two men, uh, a man and a woman, black, white, whatever, two adults, you know, coming together in a loving relationship, if that's what those two individuals, that if that's their path, that's their path. Yeah. It's really none of my business. They're not violating my volition in any way. Sure, of course. I can be yeah. whoever I want to be. But those aren't, it's not really healthy images that are, be, it's not loving relationships. It's really just a strange brew of debauchery. I don't know. What's, what's the word, Lana? Yeah, I know. What do you call this? <laughs> what do you call it? Jeez. Well, there's another aspect to this. Speaking of feminism, Greer, who you brought up, she argued in her book, it was called The Female Eunuch, that women don't realize how much men hate them. And this is something that you hear a lot of the famous feminists saying a lot of times. That, I mean, they're man haters, some of them. And it's like, speak for yourself, lady. That's your experience. I've had great experiences with men. So Again, right. It's all individuals. You can't, you can't generalize in that way. With any one group, you just can't. 
And sure, I'm sh there are men out there who have had experiences in life who lead them to, you know, very unhealthy relationships with women. And then there are men out there who are the, the opposite of that, who are supportive and loving. And it's just, again, individuals. And so this platform, it seems to me, not being familiar with her, but from what you've said, it seems to me, again, it's being used to divide and conquer. That's right. There's this quote I heard a long time ago, that which the gods would destroy first they defied. And that is true. It is such an old strategy. It is so obvious to me. I see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. And, you know, these, these things that we all get hung up on, these illusions of differences, of separateness, it's, it's, uh, it's really sad. It's tragic because we have so much more in common. Yep. More divide and conquer strategies, the promotion of, I think you said this earlier, unhealthy sex. And I also think that sex is a, is a powerful thing between two people and they can channel that energy. People have known this for centuries and they want to meddle with that as well. They want to mess up that lower chakra, <laughs> your base chakra and take advantage of it and control it. Right. They want to redirect your energy towards their ends, their agendas and their interests, and their interests are not the same as ours. For the most part, from what I can understand, they're psychopaths. Oh, yeah. So we don't have a lot in common with them. And yet, you know, they're, they're running just about everything that, that affects us every day. You know, again, get back to the, the GMOs and Monsanto, because this really, it, it really bothers me that more people don't even understand this. But... The FDA and our government, our, our representatives, the people that are allegedly out there to protect us on, our, you know, they're work, working on our behalf. They're giving them free reign to essentially just experiment on us. Yep. They're like, go ahead, put it out there. The Americans aren't onto it like some of the people over in Europe where it's yeah, outlawed. Yeah, that's why I'm like, why aren't, not onto it. why aren't the Europeans louder? Like, hello, America, or maybe they are, but then the press just blocks them. And I tell people that here all the time, you know, <laughs> a very small percentage of Europe has fluoride in their water and they, they've banned GMOs. So, hello, you know, it's like and people are so brainwashed. They just think, no, FDA doesn't lie. No, they're not bought and sold. No, nah, government never lies to me. It's and I don't. <laughs> right. And I don't want to say, hey, believe me, GMOs are bad or, or believe me, fluoride is bad. I would just love to see an open debate and discussion about these things in, in the public. Good I point. would like for people to just have discussions about this. Look at the research that's out there. There are so many resources available to us. We have scientists and, you know, intellectuals all over the place that should be looking at this and yep. figuring out, hey, let's just answer the question. Is fluoride safe or is it not? And lay out the evidence for all of us laymen so that we can understand it. Once you understand it, you should be able to lay it out for us so that in a simple way that we can understand it. Exactly. You know, not being a scientist or a physicist or what have you, an expert. And, uh, you know, this is just not happening. It's all, you know, uh, polarized. Either it's, it's bad or it's good and there's nothing in between and there's no discussion about it. People just go out there and protest for, protest against. It's just, it's silly. It's yeah. childish. I saw Mercola sent a, a newsletter, got it today. I didn't read it yet, but it was something about mainstream news is finally admitting that GMOs are bad. I'm going to read it and see what it says. But did you come across that article today? No, I did not come across it today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also wonder if there's a, well, duh, ding dong, all these eugenics talk about it, but a depopulation agenda. Then I see these shows that keep emphasizing that a woman once she's 40, she's pretty much over and done with, you know, you're, that's it for you. Then I saw a stupid magazine the other day, the other day that read life after 30. <laughs> Can you imagine right. that? Soon it I will mean, read life after 20. Is there one? <laughs> is there, can, can there be life after 20? Oh my God. Can there be life? Can there be life after 40? <laughs> I don't know. But that is a meme that's out there and it's been out there for a really long time. And again, it's just, I think it's really just dividing the population and also taking away the self-confidence and self-esteem of women and men alike. 
just taking away the self-confidence and the self-esteem of individuals so that they are susceptible to authorities that are telling them what to eat, what to drink, what to think, what to look like, how to be, how to act in a relationship, how to, you know, how to speak to one another, how to communicate or not communicate, etc. We don't need that. We can think for ourselves. We just have to realize that, you know, these these systems of control were there when we were born. You're born into this system of slavery or indentured servitude. Uh, call it whatever you want, but you're born into these systems. And before you have the opportunity to have intellectual self-defense, before your mind even develops, you're being pushed through. And you're, you're being shown images, whether it be Barbie or, you know, teenagers with Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus, whatever. It's all, it, it's, it's, uh, it's psychological warfare. <laughs> and it's happening when we're children. So we have to just realize that it's out there and it happened to us and we're all at various stages. But if we're cognizant of it, if we're aware of it, then we can defend ourselves against it. And we can teach other people that it's out there. We can show them, they can see it for themselves, and then they can protect themselves against it. You've probably heard Henrik talking about this, but in Sweden, in the schools, right away at a young age, they're trying to do away with uh, terms like he and she, and they're having books where there's uh, no family unit <laughs> pictures in the in the stories it's like a giraffe and an elephant or anything but a man and a woman together having a kid i've heard something about this there's there's going to be no longer be quote mother or father but instead partner so it's this sort of like androgynous thing like we're we're partners yep we're not hu we're we're not husband and wife or mother and far father we're just uh these robots. <laughs> Don't you think that's going to mess with kids? I mean, we're meddling with the very forces of nature and we fight it with needles and syringes. You know. Again, I do not understand why we are letting people define these terms for us and define how we label ourselves. And I'm not even sure why we're all so interested in labeling ourselves so quickly before we even figure out some things here. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's, it's again, it's about giving away your power giving away your decision-making and your choice in your life. And when you do that, you're not living your life. Well, what do you think about nature? I mean, we're, we're children of the earth. We're made of the earth. So didn't nature already define some of the roles of what's masculine and feminine? Isn't it hardwired into us? Well, possibly, yes. And, and also there may be variations of that. I mean, who am I to judge what any individual feels or wants to express through their journey in this world. But I think that naturally we want to be individuals and we want to be volitionally living our lives. We fear what? We fear death. We fear uh, predators. We fear things that take away our volition, that take away our right to choice and to live our lives how we ever we want to here. So long as we're not hurting anyone or violating anyone else's volition. I think that's a very natural thing. Now, sure, there are some people who are predators here or, as Rich would say, intraspecific kleptoparasites. Mm -hmm. People, you know, of the same species preying on one another. Yeah, there are predators, but I think that 99% of the people here are just, uh, as someone else I know would say, just salt of the earth, good people. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that. That I has been too. my experience. Yeah, me too. Even look at America after the time of some kind of crisis or hurricane. Look at how many people actually help. It's a very small percentage that are trying to go steal color TVs, you know? Right, and, and it's very small. And then a lot of that also is propaganda because during uh, Katrina, you saw images of certain people with supplies and that was looting. And then you saw uh -huh. images of other people with supplies And that was just called uh, doing what you had to do to survive. So again, why are we letting people label things for us? Why aren't we doing our own thinking? And, uh, you know, it's, it's important to, uh, to understand the neglected aspects. Some of the things that you and I have been discussing that, you know, we didn't learn in school, that wasn't in the textbooks, 
but we managed to find our way through some some history books and other resources um, because the psychological warfare is being pervaded largely through good-intentioned individuals under the guise of these things like feminism or whatever other ism you want to put on it. You know, we, we have the ability to think for ourselves so that these things can be a plague of the past instead of an ailment of the present that festers into the future. Yeah, I hate, I hate that. Uh, I like bacon and eggs, but Edward Bernays <laughs> is responsible for Mr. Bacon and Eggs. I'm like, ah, you know, just the other day I was like, ah, I don't want it because of him, you know. <laughs> well, maybe it's not all bad because bacon and eggs are, are good for you. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's the essential fatty acids and uh, all, all the good fats that give you that, that boost of energy, right. that slow burning energy through that. I mean, that's what Dave Asprey and the, the Bulletproof Diet and all of that is, mm-hmm. is based on, or at least that's one of the foundations of it. But, um, you know, so it's not all bad. Again, we have to think for ourselves. If they're pushing something on you like bacon and eggs, go and do your own research. Is this good? And then if they're pushing something like cornflakes and you do the research and you find out that, oh, that's what they did with like whatever the extra corn, they had it pressed into flakes and they used it at psychiatry hospitals and and all these institutions, you know, and then you look at the ingredients and you say, wait a minute, this isn't healthy. Again, just do your own thinking. Be oh yeah, eggs and bacon is totally demonized in America, you know? Yeah, I well, there are a lot that. of things. Yeah, there are a lot of things that are being purveyed and it's just really up to us and it's it's not easy, which is why we need to come together because we can't all be experts in every area of our lives, you know? But uh, some of us are, you know, have uh, have expertise in various areas. And if we come together, we can do this thing called learning and communicating and find our way through. Hey, I know you're not big on the New Age movement either, but another area where feminism comes up is in the New Age movement. I've been hearing it a lot. <laughs> Basically, ladies saying, this is the time of the female uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because a lot of these women also feel like they kind of harbor some secret resentment towards men. Well, I haven't done much research on the New Age movement, but I will mention that Mark Passio recently did a seven-hour presentation at his Free Your Mind conference that someone suggested to me, and I haven't listened to it yet, but I will, and it's all about the New Age movement and how it's really this new religion for intellectuals and 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 people who, uh, again, are good intentioned, but they've really, um, they've stopped thinking for themselves and they become part of this thing that is a collective and doesn't necessarily have their best interests in mind. So that's all I can really say about it, which I guess isn't much, but I would, uh, I would suggest Mark Passio's presentation since it was suggested to me by someone who, uh, usually has a good sense about these things and, uh, maybe learn more. Yeah, I'd say, why can't it be the time of the male and female together? <laughs> you know, again, another divide and conquer thing. We all, have, yeah, we all have something to contribute. We just need to be symbiotic and put down the competitiveness and, you know, figure out how our energy is being redirected into all these things and, and just take it back ourselves and say, here's, you know, again, it's, there's a balance. I think there is a natural balance in the world. And we can all make each other stronger instead of whittling each other down and taking away because all that's doing is defeating ourselves and feeding in to this other agenda that is destructive. So I would just, I would just say that, again, the antidote to this social control, to the divide and conquer, the, the antidote is to learn our way out and to start thinking for ourselves and to then come together because that's the only way that we can effectively resist and create the world that we want to live in. Definitely. And on one more note, since we're talking about women in divide and conquer, there's also, I've, I've been seeing a lot of anti-white women propaganda in TV that the white blondes are always bigots, racist, arrogant, rude, stupid, selfish, bad moms and bad wives. That's another area that's really being attacked right now. And it's just, it's the same themes. And yep. the brunette is is shy and smart and awkward and 
doesn't get the best looking guy according to this ideal, you know, feminine and masculine beauty. And it's just, again, the same things played over and over for us. And so then when you see people acting out these roles, then, you know, you have to realize that that's why it's not their fault. They just started emulating the adults around them before they realized they could think for themselves. Yep, that's right. And then it's reinforced our whole lives. So you find yourself, you know, 20-something, 30-something, 40-something with this theme of I'm not good enough. This theme in your life of I'm not good enough. I have to be different. I have to change. And not only that, but these labels. I'm blonde. I'm ditzy. I'm brunette. I'm smart. Whatever they are. And if if we don't realize that, then we're going to be suffering as a result of it. I know I personally suffered through that I'm not good enough thing most of my life. And it wasn't until I started realizing these things and how my perception of myself, my self-image, my self-confidence my role as a woman, as a sister, whatever it was, had been predefined for me. I never gave it any thought. I just sort of became. Yeah, that's really key. Yeah, we learn, we learn from the other people who come here before us. And if we've all been born into slavery and subject to the same system of control, then, you know, we can't really pass on wisdom that is going to allow people to break free of that. So we have to disrupt this pattern that's being played out generation over generation and put some learning into the equation and some nonviolent, or I like to call it compassionate communication into the equation and figure out how to get things done, you know, together as individuals. I have to keep saying that because I know people say that's collective. Yeah, we have to break the cycle. And sometimes we've learned bad things from our moms too, our moms and our dads. And that's a hard process. I mean, I talk to girlfriends now that are still dealing with things from their childhood at, you know, 30 and 40, but it must be done to break the cycle. Right. And again, it happens a lot when you're a child and you don't have the intellectual self-defense because your brain is not yet fully developed. And so these things happen to you and you feel that you cause them. It's your fault, et cetera, et cetera. And that, again, is just this this self-loathing, self-destructive path. And as an adult, you almost get into that same childlike mindset of this is my fault or as a uh, Mark Passio said uh, at one point that this woman had said to him, there are no bad experiences. There are just experiences. And that is not true. He's like, tell that to someone who has been abused or tortured in any number of ways, the things that are going on right now around the planet. You can't say that. That is not true. But what they have to realize is that at any point in your life, you know, what happened happened and you can move forward. You can work through that. And you can take responsibility and say that, hey, that happened. I am who I am because of it. And you can move forward. You can live your life. You have the other choice of being a victim. But I think it's, uh, you know, and again, I can't speak for everyone. But personally, I feel that I'm stronger because of everything that happened in my life, for better or worse. And, you know, at, at some point, you just have to say, I'm responsible for my happiness. That's right. I think that's a good place to wrap up, Lisa. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. I'm very thankful for your time this afternoon. Thanks, Lana. I really appreciate your time also. And uh, again, I appreciate your persistence in uh, getting me back on the show. (laughs) You're worth it. (laughs) Tragedyandhope.com is the website. I'll write everyone that's it for now. And be sure to look out for the Delta Aquarids Meteor Shower, which is peaking this Saturday night, July 27th. Bye for now.